I extend a special thank you to Not Bound, which is the charity here in Australia with whom I am co-producing these chats down under. And I extend a special thank you to the Yorkshire Hotel in Melbourne for hosting us here for the chats. So without further ado, Johnny, T without further ado, Johnny Tyndall. Okay, I'm going to spit this out one way or the other. Uh, <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your, your early life. I understand your early years were relatively tumultuous. They were. Um, at a relatively early age, my mother and my father split up. Mm. So life continued in two homes on the east coast of Australia, one in Sydney, one in Ballina, where I was born. And court orders, I would spend time with my father and his family and eventually my very first step monster that I still love. And that would be holidays and then I'd do my schooling in Sydney and uh, I'd spend that time with my mother and my stepfather who basically raised me and his dad. Oh, you say that his second wife, your stepmother, was your step monster. Why do you say that? Do you know, she's resting now. She's gone. But she was the only step parent, at least on that side, and there have been a couple, that really worked at getting to know me. Um, she even tried bribing me and I was not having any of it. Um, she came between me and dad so she was the enemy, um, at, at least at the beginning. But with time and with a lot of love and care, you know, she was also my second mother. But she was my first step monster. She was the enemy. <laughs> okay, but yet you, you have affection for her, so... I do. She, she had a baby who became my little sister, Renee. And um, I was putting, she was putting in my arms, and I guess that was the moment where I was like, okay, okay, well, I've now got a little sister. I've got to take care of her. I've got to, yeah. So Monster became affection, and she was mum. And as Renee got older, instead of me calling her Cheryl, because, well, it would confuse Renee, I'd call her mum while I was away, with permission from my mother. Mm -hmm. so that she didn't feel like I was betraying my mother. So yeah, it, it was hard. There was always two sets of values. There were already always two sets of rules. Um, there was two sets of curfews. Sometimes there were even two schools because things happen in families. And I'd go and spend more time there because my father was going through something, or should I say my stepdad to define it, going through something. And my mother would see, okay, let's best to go over there for a little while. Um, I didn't always enjoy going home to dad, um, but I always loved my little sister. And I eventually loved my stepmother. And when she passed away, um, my sister called me and said, John, mum has gone. And my first expression was, holy crap, I can't deal with this. We need to call the adults. Um, <laughs> and on a conference call to my mother, and I'm like, mum, um, Cheryl's gone. Mum's gone. Um, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do for Renee. Um, my mother said, you just go. Go. Go to her. And so I helped Renee go through all of that trouble, the cremation, the burial, um, the, the arrangements. It was hard, you know, because I was saying goodbye to somebody that she loved so very much mm -hmm. and that you know, wasn't actually a bad old girl in the, uh, in, in, the, in the scheme of things. If I was to give you an iconic person who she was like, she was like Magna Savinsky um, and that character that she plays in Kath and Kim, um, she was just like her, you know, winning medals for netball and, you know, always going to hockey and becoming, you know, a state champion. Um, so she was a spawning big girl with a big girl personality and for some reason she loved me. You were raised Jehovah's Witness. I was. Uh, for the benefit of the audience, would you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Tell people what really that's all about? Look, at Jehovah's Witnesses is from a very strict other Christianity. Okay, so they're not Catholic. They do believe in the Bible. They believe it's God's testament to man and our scripture to learn from. We don't take blood transfusions. We don't get into local politics, as in 
you know, who's you know, going to be elected as the Prime Minister. We don't celebrate birthdays and we don't celebrate Christmas because they're basically pagan ceremonies that have been adopted by Christianity for people to come together. However, in places where those things are celebrated, we're expected to at least be respectful um, and enjoy the family moment. Um, I mean, a good old expression is when in Rome do as the Romans. Mm -hmm. So it's hard because you've got a, a very strict upbringing here and you go to dad and dad's was, well, you want to go out, you know, be back by 2 a.m. At home, while I was going through my high school, it was, you better be back by the lights go out. And if you're not back, you better call me and tell me where you are and give me a number to call them and so that I can call their parents and there must be an adult there. And there were a lot of rules, a lot of rules. So it was always hard to work out what the boundary should be, where I should be, where I should be in my head. Um, always hard learning two versions of the history of the world, uh, Darwinism, Dar Darwinism and creation. And sometimes we'd be asked questions about those things in school, but they'd never qualify which version that they wanted. So, you know, confusing, yes. I was raised innocent and I'm uh, grateful for that. Um, and I became myself from, yeah, needing to. Well, what does the Jehovah's Witness belief teach as far as academics, if, if what you're saying there are two versions of history? They believe in creationism. Um, the, the world was created in 6,000 years. Um, and then, of course, we've got to add the time of pre-Christ and the time of. So the, the world is, <coughs> is not 60 million years old like you know, we're taught. Um, by fossil dating, it's the other. Um, and, you know, they have very, very strict beliefs on Bible study. I mean, actually, my Bible study came before my, my homework did. Um, we went to church five times a week, um, for which there was at least three hours of study before that, so that we either understood, we could participate, we were included. Um, they teach public speaking from a very, very early age, and it was about five or six I gave my very first sermon in the smaller chapel or hall. Um, and right up until the point that I was disfellowshipped, I was having Bible studies with younger, younger people. Um, the younger people would tell me I would make the stories come to life. You know, um, Dad would give me a comic book and there'd be Superman and Mum would give me my Bible stories and there would be Jesus Christ and the Twelve Apostles and the Predates. So they were my, my heroes to start with. They were heavily indoctrinated, but at the same time, through choice. But you said you had difficulties in school because mm. you didn't know which version of history to put on a test, for example. Exactly. And... Uh, Look, Australia's come a long way to the standardization of tests, I've got to say that. And they've come a long way in qualifying the question, but at that time, no, they didn't qualify the question. And there have been times where I completely failed history because I used the wrong version. It wasn't qualified. However, they would mark me on what I wrote down and they would eventually turn around and say, look, why? Let's work on this. And I'd say, well, Okay, creationism is what I was taught at home. Um, you taught me differently, and I'm willing to accept that, but you need to qualify what it is that you're asking. Huh. Relig <laughs> religious studies happen um, by elective, by parents in, in a lot of state schools. Um, so, you know, I'd go to school and once a week we'd all meet the young Jehovah's Witnesses in a room, just like band or choir or, you know, and we would have a religious study there at school. Um, so it was an elective. It was accepted that this happened. And all the religions had their little places. So. That's fascinating. Fascinating that that would be incorporated into the academia. Yeah, I mean, again, mm. Australia has come a long way in, in uh, being able to coexist next to many, many different types of people. Um, I remember in Sydney being when the first um, Asian boy came to the school, his name was Daniel. I'd never seen anybody with eyes like that. Mm. And he was a Jehovah's Witness and he was terrified. 
And we became the best of mates, me, Daniel, and Christian. And to this day, I'm still in contact with Christian. Um, you know, so academia and religion, although they weren't intertwined, they coexisted very happily. How did you reconcile those beliefs coming out into being gay? It was really, really hard. Um, I, I need to just say this to you. From the moment that I knew I was different, I didn't know what that different was. And every day I would be called gay, you're gay, you're gay. And I, I didn't really know what gay was, to be honest with you. Uh, the word that had been taught to me at home was a homosexual, very lab type word, not gay. Mm. And gay was used <coughs> as a taunt. It meant that you were less than equal. Um, of course, differences lead to research, finding out, am I gay? Um, I know I'm different. I can see that I'm different from you guys. But am I what you're calling me? Um, and when I came to the realization that they could actually sense what I was before I was, I even knew what it was, then I had to reconcile that. And I had to reconcile that against my faith and what the, the repercussions were going to be the moment that I turned around and said, Mom, Dad, I'm gay. It's about to come out at school. Um, I had to be prepared. And I was. And I was how? just ready, <laughs> yeah. But how? Well, I had a, a school counselor who was a lesbian, not an out lesbian. And she was, she was very concerned for me because I would go through some breakdowns. No mental health issues as such, just complete feedback loops of confusion. Hmm. Um, and one day I went to her, and sometimes life wasn't always great at home. My father, as a, and I, I qualify that as my stepdad, as much as he was an awesome guy, okay, um, when he drank, he wasn't so awesome. And he could never just drink wine, it was to excess. Mm -hmm. So he was a recovered alcoholic. Sometimes he would slip. Life would be turned upside down for three or four days. Mm. Um, but my father, on the other side, was no different, actually. He was an alcoholic, or is an alcoholic. Don't know if he still is now, don't really have any contact with him. But, um, you know, there were some Christmases that were absolutely terrifying because my father was so drunk that the slightest thing set him off. Um, so my, my school counsellor was concerned. Uh, she would always know when my grades would dip. Um, I'd always be called in and one day I said to her, Miss, I'm really confused but I think I might be gay. Am I gay? Help me here. And she said, well, I can't tell you if you are or you're not. Oh. This is a, a thing that you have to discover yourself. However, you know you've been looking for books in the library. Well, they don't exist in our library there because we're not allowed to have them there. But she had a lot of publications that were tucked away just for emergency use. Mm -hmm. And I would come to her, her counseling space and I'd sit there and I'd read and I'd absorb and eventually I came to the conclusion, okay, I am gay, but I need to find out more. So I actively sought out uh, a single sex relationship, or at least a play date, a fuck, whatever you want to call it. And I liked it. I liked it a lot. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe that's just a fluke. So I did it again. And again, whilst lying to my parents. How were you finding these people? It's really not that hard. <laughs> I mean, okay. when you live in Mullumbimby, there's such a large population of alternative people. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you know, it's relatively easy. And when you have the outward <coughs> qualities, they would find you. Okay. Um, and, of course, you know, they'd pop up at times and you'd be like, huh, oh, I didn't know. Really? You look so normal. Um, was usually one of my first expressions. And of course they'd say, well, so do you. But you told me that the Jehovah's Witness faith resemble, the traits rather, resemble those of a good leather man. Tell us about that. Well, yeah. Um, I was raised with structure. 
that's the first word I'm going to say. Um, almost military precision structure. Um, and those boundaries were very good because they, they helped me understand what I needed to be and where I needed to be and how I needed to be. And I had that structure while I was with mum and dad at home in Sydney or in Ocean Shores, depending on where I am in life. Um, good Leatherman, they, they adhere to some good structure. Now, we, we believe in brotherhood or fraternity, as the old guards would say, in service. Um, being present, love, love of our brother, um, quite often unconditionally because, you know, leather men are there, that first sign of trouble, they're usually the first ones to open their pockets as well. Um, and Jehovah's Witnesses, in a very similar way, believe in those sort of same things. Love for each other, you know, kindness, virtuous, um, service, lots of service, okay, um, being charitable, being kind, helping those other people who are less fortunate than yourselves. We build kingdom homes together. Um, my father and I, uh, 30, 32 years ago, I was 10, laid the cornerstone in the Paddington Kingdom Hall, which is one of the most beautiful spaces that they've ever built. And it, it, it has six or seven congregations that use it. That hall basically runs from 6 a.m. to 1 p.m. 1 a.m. every day. Wow. Um, with many congregations. There's a full deaf congregation there. I'm sorry, a full... Deaf congregation. Deaf. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so, structure. Very important. Study. Very important. It's very important to a leather man to find out how this came about. Yeah. At least the ones that, you know, need to know. And I, I need to know things because that's how I can either rationalize it or make it, make it my own. And these leather men showed me that the reason I wasn't fitting into the shiny boys that were very self-centered, mm -hmm. it was all about what they were wearing and uh, what, who they were fucking and what drugs they were taking. And it was all about them. It was me, 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 me. Nothing more than me. Right, right. Um, and then they found me, and it was all about the service to our community. And how do we keep our community safe? And how do we teach our community you know, good sexual habits? Um, I came in at the end of the AIDS epidemic, yeah. so sexual habits had to be addressed. So structure was important. And giving back to the sick. You know, that, that first time you meet somebody who's dying of HIV is quite confronting. But I would see people who were sick in my religion all the time, and we would bring them meals. We'd bring them flowers. We would sit by their bed. We would study with them. Um, we would bring them recordings of the latest. So they're very similar in the way that they serve their fellow man and that they love their fellow man. I mean, so much so that I wear my heart on my sleeve. It's in the shape of a diamond because my heart's pretty tough, you know, um, and it's very important to me. But when you came out, mm. your mother took you to a doctor. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. So um, part of my year 12 was I gave back to some less fortunate children in the public school. They didn't have a computer lab, and I was somewhat of a computer prodigy, genius. And all the others were doing their little assignments, but um, part of mine was to teach the less fortunate kids who were having trouble with their dyslexia and that, that there are other ways. So I was given a Mac, and I thought, well, maybe they need to go that way. So I brought half of our computer lab with a teacher to them, and I would sit there once a day for six months and every child that had a disability would come in and we'd see, this is a mouse. This helps you click around. This program is all about numbers and it's visual. Maybe this is why you're having trouble with this. And you could turn those numbers into algebra and all of a sudden they were like, oh my God, I get this now. They're not speaking another language. But it came out that I was gay, quite alternative. 
Um, and I was coming to terms with it. And finally, when I come to terms with it, it would be, well, yes, maybe I am. I'm nearly there. Mm. Nearly there. And of course, that's big news. A young man in school, almost proudly coming out, well, nearly proudly coming out. And they run this article about Mr. Fixit having lots of young admirers. And then on the very next page, there was a story also about me, not conjunctive, but terrifyingly, you know, close to it. Um, and all they showed were my Doc Martens. Um, and of course, my mother said at the table, honey, he's got the same boots as you. One day before my last day in my formal, I thought, well, it's about to come out and someone's going to say something to my mother, at least at my graduation. It's time to... And I plucked up the courage and I walked into there with the coffee and I said, Mum, we've got to talk. And she went, it's too early, honey. I'll wait till later. No, Mum, this is really important. I need to talk to you now. Honey, no. Mummy hasn't had her coffee yet. Coffee. She sat up in bed and I said, Mum, I'm gay. She went, you think you're gay? No, Mum, I am gay. How do you know that? You've never been with a... Uh, yes, Mum, I have. And have you been with a woman? Well, I tried. It got really messy and I threw up over her. <laughs> um, yes, Mum, I'm gay. And she pulled the pillow in front of her like it was a shield. And she said, honey, get dressed now. You're not going to school. Okay. Get in the car. And so as we drive the 20 minutes to my school, and then we drive 40 minutes into the hills where our family doctor is, who runs a practice, she marches past the secretary. She opens the door. My mother was somewhat quite dramatic. Um, she pulls this person out of this easy chair and says, we need him more. She throws me into the chair and she says, Martin, he's broken, fix him. And she drags his poor unsuspecting person who's there to you know, do their, and she stands guard at the door. <laughs> Martin was horrified first. He's like, so what have you done, mate? What have you done? Have you stolen a car or something? I mean, your brothers used to do that. And I went, no, Martin. Have you got a girl pregnant? Uh, no, no, Martin, no. You burned down the science lab. And there was a string of these, you know, uh, no, Martin. Then what is it? I went, Martin, I'm gay. And he went, and? Martin, I'm gay, and we're Jehovah's Witnesses, and this doesn't really, and she's freaking out. And, and he's like, oh. Oh, never done, oh. And so he goes to his drawer, and he pulls out two Tic Tacs. He says, you'll take those Tic Tacs and you'll say you're cured and that will give you some breathing space. And I went, Martin, I've been leading a double life. I can't do this anymore. It's time for me. I know it's about to happen. I'm terrified. I'm really terrified. But the sooner it happens, the sooner I start building my life again. Um, as a Jehovah's Witnesses, our friends are Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. Their parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe in sending us to school so that we see the world for the world. We don't really homeschool. Um, it's important that we see that. So existing there is always hard, okay? And I knew I was about to lose my friends. I was about to lose my aunties and my uncles. I was about to lose my brothers and my sisters. And worst of all, I was going to lose my mother. She was my best friend from everywhere and my dad. And I just hoped that they loved me enough that we could sort of somehow work this out in an, am an amenable way. But the brothers were very, very strict about this. And they said, all you have to do is say that you're sorry for the act that you've had with men. And I, could, I went, I, I can't apologize for something that I'm not sorry for. I can't apologize for something that it comes naturally to me. And the brothers looked at me and they went, well, then if you're not sorry for what you did, you will be disfellowshipped on this date. They gave me two and a half months to just get it. 
and it then was announced and the doors of the church closed to me oh. and that's it no family no friends no support I'm totally alone in the world that's how the Jehovah's Witnesses do they, they did say to me look you can be gay just <laughs> don't act on it I said so you're telling me I'm not allowed to be loved or to love someone that seems very unfair no, I, I don't think I can be part of a religion that teaches love but can't actually love me. You were very bullied in school. Terribly. But there's an interesting twist to that. Tell us about it. So I was taught I was never to hit back and certainly never to hit women. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I took the beatings. Where I could run the gauntlet, I'd run the gauntlet. But there was one person, and, and again, I say this the word lesbian wasn't really in my vocabulary, so tomboy, will, it, it suffices. She wore Doc Martens. She was relatively active. She knew what I was. And on a regular basis, she would pin me down and hold my foot and my head in the mud by a boot, and she'd say, you've just got to be stronger. You have no idea what's in the world. You've just got to be stronger. Okay. I got a title and a couple of years later, <coughs> somebody else got another title. And it, the connection was made that we both went to the same high school. It's funny what happens on those forms. And uh, she comes up to me and at this point she's transitioning into a gay man. What is your surname? Apparently we went to school, I went Tyndall and, and she froze and she went, she pulled a cigarette out of my packet and she put it in my mouth. You're going to need this. Fuck, I need this. Put it down. You drink new, don't you? It's new. That's what you like. Yeah, drink new. I had no idea what was about to fall. She went into the, the bar and she comes out with two great big pictures of them. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? Honey, where are our glasses? Oh, what we have to talk about, we do not need glasses. She told me her surname, her real surname, the one that no one knows. And I stepped back and all of a sudden, I was 14, 15, and I was terrified. And I braced myself and I thought, you know what, it takes a big person to admit to this. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, you know what, if he can come to me and say, I did this to you, and I'm sorry, then I should be able to listen. And I should be able to, as a leader in my community, take that step and go, okay. And so I sat on the stool, and there were lots of tears, and eventually there was a big old cuddle. Now that person is one of my best friends in the world. Oh. She's known as Danny Fruit Pig Xanadu Bandit. Um, or various incarnations of that. She won't mind me saying that. And she is one of my sounding boards. She is one of the people that I get advice for, for my trans boy, because I have a trans boy in my family. And um, yeah, she's also been one of my greatest supporters, one of my greatest, you know, she, she shakes the Johnny bucket occasionally. She's helped me navigate interpersonal difficulties um, and she's also made them see that you know I was brought up differently so I do see the world differently from them it's not wrong it's just different and we move on how were you introduced into the kink scene the kink leather scene well I rode a motorbike let's start there um, I worked pretty much in every gay bar on Oxford Street from one end to the other to make ends meet. I even prostituted myself at times. I had to. You know, eating's kind of a necessity. Was that lucrative? Um, as me, it was, yeah. Yeah, because I was adorable and oh. I had the babs and I had the blonde hair and I had the blue eyes. And, you know, I was truly innocent, or at least I could remember what innocence was. And um, yes, it was. And I worked in a cafe and I was cited for misappropriation of money. Now, all of our tills were monitored by cameras. I knew that. We counted in front of a camera. We put our tills in front of a camera. Only one person touched a till. 
And of course, one day I'm called up to Sir's big office um, in T2, as people would know, or where the barracks used to be. And he's like, son, what have you done? I went, nothing, sir. Well, I have a problem in this place. I went, yes, you do. Okay, who's the problem? I think you already know that. It's not my job to tell you what my boss is doing. And he went, huh. well, this is going to be a hard lesson. You need to go fire him. It's part of the job. And I went, excuse me. And he went, you need to. Go on. Go and fire him. I know it's him. It's all fine. He'll come to me. It will just go do it. So I did. <laughs> that was one of the first steps. And I came back and he went, you did a good job. I watched that. And he's putting up all these monitors. And I'm like, what is this place? Oh, he went, this is where I watch my empire. And of course, there was this row of monitors. And what was on them was utterly filthy. I mean, fun filthy, but utterly. And I'm like, so you're watching porn. But no, that's what's going on underneath me. How do I not know about this? <laughs> I mean, well, you're kind of one of our nice boys. We don't really publicize what we do in that place. But you got to work there because, you know, you look within your leathers. And, and at that same time, I was also introduced to a daddy. And he was having trouble with his computer. And Big Brother's like, look, let's get Johnny here. He'll fix it. He was struggling with Photoshop. And um, I had no idea what it was that I was looking at. And eventually, I've pushed Daddy Ray aside. And I've gone, just let me do this. And I've, in about 20 clicks, the page was right, the layers were right, and we were ready to send it to the printers. And then I've gone, oh, holy crap, is that what I, oh. And he's like, yeah, this is our big, you know, but you work on the main stage at the Horden, and you're here, and you, you for the, maybe you should be involved as well. And that daddy also became a sir, and he helped mold my life, give it some meaning, introduced me to these people that weren't just there having sex, if you understand what I mean, mm -hmm. that they had some structure. And that structure was needed in me because it helped me function. It's how I was raised. Um, so, leather life began. And it never really ever stopped. I've always found vanilla sex just boring. It's like, well, go away. Give me something interesting to do. And, you know, 101 workshops teach you about all sorts of things. And eventually, you're not just the bunny that's being having it done to because guess what? You know, you've got a high pain threshold. All of a sudden, you know, you're teaching this. Teaching sounding. Teaching fisting. Teaching them. Teaching Budget Master. That's one of my favorite courses. You know? But this also led you to a position within Sydney Leather Pride. It did. It did. And you didn't you, you uh, run for the presidency, but they felt you were too young? Kind of, yeah. Um, I was urged to run for the presidency because I'd done the time, I knew the organization. Um, excuse the expression, but I knew where all the bodies were buried. Um, where not to dig, so to speak. Um, and so I went to the election, but I, I wouldn't play the game. I'm not going to go out there and say, hi, I'm Johnny, vote for me. I figure I'll either get it because I'm the right person or I won't. So the first time they elected somebody who'd never been part of Leather Pride ever, um, and that was an interesting year, that was difficult at times, but I tried to be their friend. I tried to help them because I was the special events coordinator. So me and the president had to work very closely together over things. And I tried to help him with his interviews, but they would always go drastically wrong. Um, and so, you know, sometimes we'd come to loggerheads. And then the next year came along, and um, so I restood. I was re nominated, I accepted the nomination. And that year, um, our current president, which is still there, um, T.T. Charte, or somebody I affectionately call Mummy Sir, somebody who still calls me Puppy after 20 odd years, and she's like, no, that's Puppy. And you know, they, they, they call me to the stage, and I'm, Puppy Johnny Tyndall, and I'm like, 
And my boys are snickering like, oh, there he goes. <laughs> Look at him being all submissive too. Um, and so, yeah, she's still there and um, I love her dearly. She beat me by not, not even a handful of phones. Um, so, yeah, I was too young. Not in my experience. The, it's generally an older position of somebody around 40, 40 45, 50 that holds. And at that point, I was about 32, 33, 34. So, you know, it's maybe the right person won. And, and I'll say that because, you know, I work very closely with her where I can. Didn't, but you were the president at one time, were you not? I was the president of a sister organization that broke away from Sydney Leather Pride called Harvest oh, City Bears. Oh, the Harvest City Bears. Okay. So my partner was the secretary okay. um, and he said, we need a strong leader. There's a lot of things that are behind the scenes that need to be fixed. We need a strong leader. And I said, no. I said no four times and other people came to me and I said no and then another organization came to me and said look we really want you to transit the presidency to a younger president you've been trained to do this you can do this um, so I was the president for exactly 11 months which was the full term in that case because there was some things that had to do and we had to move some Mardi Gras moved uh, some time that we had to have things in place, which meant that we needed to fall in line with the Mardi Gras election period so that we were all working at the same time for the same goals. Um, and we weren't running late, and we weren't submitting artwork late. And, you know, it, it, when you live in a city that has so much politically happening and so, much, uh, so many organisations, well, we all have to sort of sync up because we all do something at the same time of the year every year, which is the parade and the party. And so I had to bring it all in line. I had to make it possible for us to achieve the gold line, these guidelines and then to move to future planning so that we were already ahead when the notice came out that you know, float registration, uh, event registration, photography and, and artwork need to be in by this date and this is the theme. And so... My job was, one, um, to fix the structure, stabilize the club, deal with some really horrible things of a past president, bring back the love, um, and mend a rift between two organizations, which I did. So tell us about the Sydney scene today. How today. Is well, I was raised old guard, okay? Um, so, I, if to use a term conservative, conservative level. Um, when I first came out, there was very little coexistion between men and women. We didn't really even know trans people. We stayed separate. We came together for fundraisers, we came together for the odd dance party, we came together for special events, and we were a big family, and it worked. But generally, we were quite separatist by sexuality and gender. Now, times are changing. Sometimes I'm even rushing to catch up um, because I don't deal with change well, quickly. Um, there's, a, there's a planning period for change in me, okay? And now we have the girls wanting to be with the guys on a more regular basis. And for the most, that's a great thing. However, it makes some of them uncomfortable. And so we're moving to an inclusive um, um, state. And that happened because we were no longer allowed to run same-sex events anyway, so single-sex events. The government said, if you want to run single-sex events, well, it's 40 grand. And we'd say, why? And they go, because well, that's what it costs us in the complaints, basically. 40 grand gets you the certificate, we'll take the complaints and say, they're, they're making the money, they're paying us, it's good. So a couple of places got those licenses, saunas, uh, fuck clubs. Um, and there used to be a lot of those. Now there's literally three places on Oxford Street. Uh, two saunas left, one sauna in the city. Um, the places where we could have 
gone because they either couldn't support the requirements, they couldn't find the funding to remain single sex. But Sydney Leather Pride 20 years ago seen this change coming and they started to promote it and we brought the girls in and the Dykes on Bikes sort of joined and the bears broke away because they didn't really f want to be told how to dress. They're their own you know, fetish and, and fraternity in themselves. And so we've been working towards an inclusive state for 20 years. Sometimes it's worked really well. Other times it has gone up in smoke. Um, but we keep walking towards it. And now we are nearly there. We are nearly at where there are more places where we are included than where we're excluded into these gender and sexuality roles. And that's a good thing. Okay. You always wear your IML medal mm. right here. Why do you choose to wear that? It's close to my heart. It's my most precious item. It's been stolen twice. <laughs> yeah. Um, and because it reminds me of the greatest experience I ever had, of the family that I made externally to New South Wales and Australia. Um, and some great things happened there. I was summoned to the late Chuck Renslow's suite and I had missed curfew. Um, and he said, well, I can't show any favor to you because you know it will be seen as, you're my mate, you're my friend. I've known you as puppy for a very long time. But you keep the smokers and the, the young pups in order. You know, they call you boss. They sort of call you sir. And so I had my covering ceremony there. Now for years, I refused to let anybody call me sir. Until I was slapped and said, look, you were the last sir and the last covering ceremony that we know happened. With you, Chuck Renslow. You yeah, mean. with Chuck yeah. Renslow. Yeah. You will use your title, it's disrespectful not to. And I had to turn around and take a great big thought and go, oh, oh, he was a good friend. He came to Australia at semi-regular intervals. Oh, I never seen it that way. So now my boys call me sir. They don't call me boss dog, they don't call me alpha. They call me sir. One calls me daddy. Uh, the ones that are in my house call me Daddy Sir, which is adorable. Um, and so they're learning. And they show respect to me, which is always somewhat a little bit weird, because I was always, you know, the subby boy. Um, but apparently I've got a big massacre side as well, so who knew? In what year were you in IML? 2011. Okay. That was a great year. Lots what made it so great? Um, I think it was the first year that you guys gave each of us contact before the actual event. Okay. So some great mind turned around and created the IML 2011 contestants group. So we were already talking. It was a bit like being on the chat apps, yeah. but on Facebook Messenger. We were talking, we were exchanging photos, we were getting to know each other. So when we all got together, well, we already knew a great deal about each other, which meant it was just a formality of a cuddle. Yeah. And um, being broke into our groups of houses of where, you know, our groups that were going to be managed by our den daddies. And it was family. It was instant family. Shake and bake, just add water. Um, it was a great experience. And... I will encourage all of my boys, should they want to, I've got one that is aspiring, I've got one that's on the journey already there as a boot black, to go and do it. Because for seven days you are immersed in a culture that sometimes we feel like we're only peripherally involved in, in our community. Um, you know, my home, I'm known for my big boots, and my bleachers, and my you know, skinhead attire the occasional chaps after the sun's gone down. Um, they know me as a leather boy in Woolloomooloo and they're okay with that. They know that I have boys coming and going from my house. They're okay with that. Um, 
And that's the thing. I've created my family, and my family is connected to a wider family. And yes, they can chat to them wider, but it's only when they go and experience it do they know really just how much that family is and how big it is and where they can go when they want to go over there. Um, the people that they want to interact with, the people they want to interact sexually with, the people they want to go to dinner with. But what are your thoughts on title holding in general? Look, title holding, and, and I, I train title holders, okay? Title holding is a great thing because for a second we turn around and we give you four to six balls to juggle and we say, make it work. Let's see where you can make it work. And those who are strong, who have great leadership in them, they juggle. They, they, get, it, they get it done. And they shine, and their titles never really end. But do you see that? Uh, do you see the title scene declining, increasing? Well, it's funny here in Australia, we have now ALM, the Australian Leatherman Competition, which is held in <laughs> Sydney, um, which has kind of made the Sydney title somewhat defunct. Now, the Sydney title is coming back. Well, maybe there are discussions of it coming back or being retired, because ALM's there. And ALM, you don't need a title to actually attend. Oh, it, becomes, it becomes the feeder to IML. Oh, okay. But title holders do great work in our community. They are signposts. They are question answerers. Um, and they are eventual leaders. And if we don't replenish the leaders, then the communities die. The leaders are important because without them, we don't get new recruits, you know. Um, I had somebody say, the gay leather man is a dinosaur. It's a dying breed. And that may be true. The gay leather man may be a dinosaur that's a dying breed. However, the leather lifestyle isn't just gay leather men. You know, there are gay leather women, yeah. and gay leather bears, and gay leather pups. And, well, not gay, but you know what I mean, leather pups. And now we're seeing heteros joining us as well, and they call themselves heteroflexible. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they dabble. Yeah. Um, title holders are a great thing. They help our community grow. They stabilize it. Sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes a title holder is a great big pain in your ass. But providing they have their heart in the right place. Yeah. But what advice have you for people who are new and coming into that? Be yourself. Understand that not everybody's going to love you. Actually, you're going to probably piss a goddamn few off. But once you've got that around and you've got that in your head that you can't please everybody, but you're going to do your damn best. And you're going to try and you're going to learn and you're going to take those pointers from the people that have come before you. Providing you're willing to learn, you're going to do wonders. You're going to inspire. You're going to... You're going to replenish the ranks of the leather lifestyle. And that is, some people need that leather lifestyle. I'm one of them. I mean that. It comes as part of almost most decisions I make. Okay? Um, it, it decides whether I'm going away and instead of having a holiday with my boy is somewhere nice. I've had a working holiday this time. And I've got to meet some amazing people. Some of them title holders, some of them not. Some of them just a little bit odd and a bit quirky, but it guides my life. It gives it structure. It gives me something to fight for in my health because I have a broken back. So, you know, my lifestyle is an asset to me. It's an asset to the community. And I hope that others who need that structure, who want that structure, who are more than just dance leather men or women, they see what I do and they make positive changes in their life. What's the biggest misconception about you? My kindness is a weakness. My kindness is just because that's me. Um, that I never yell. Well, sometimes I do. 
it's rare. <laughs> it's rare. It takes a lot to really send me over the edge. And when I pop, people do duck. Um, that I hate all women, because I don't. Um, I love most of my, my leather sisters. Um, that I'm here because I'm all about power. I'm here because I'm all about love. Um, and that, yeah, I might have had a quirky, quirky upbringing, but I'm never going to throw it down your throat, not unless you actually want it. Johnny Tyndall, thank you for being part of Inside Leather History, a fireside chat in Melbourne, Australia. Thank you, Doc.